Good afternoon, and um, it's delightful to be here. I feel very honoured to be presenting this session. Um, as Christopher said, it's going to be slightly uh, shorter than some of the previous sessions, uh, and hopefully this is really in response to your comments about how things have developed. Uh, but as he's mentioned, I'm first going to begin uh, with a brief tribute to David Vaughan, um, who died last month. Uh, and as many of you will know, I've brought, just so that I can wave it at you, um, his wonderful book, on Frederick Ashton. I suspect many of you will have this uh, on your shelves at home. Uh, it is really a very, very important volume. So um, it came out first in 1977. Uh, it is an award-winning book, uh, and it really is a very useful uh, outline of uh, Ashton's career as a choreographer. Uh, and certainly the research that David did has been the basis for all the subsequent uh, work on Ashton's uh, output. Some of you may also um, uh, be aware of, of Paul Vaughan, who was David's younger brother, who was a, a radio presenter. That's just sort of to give you a little bit of context. Now, as many of you will know that Ashton himself said when he was in, uh, growing up in Lima, Peru, don't worry, I'm not going into the whole of Ashton's biography now, um, but when he was in Lima, Peru, and he saw Anna Pavlova uh, in 1918, he saw Pavlova uh, dancing in Raymonda, which was, of course, the last work we considered in this series, um, he said that he was injected with the poison, that he turned to ballet, loved ballet, as a result of seeing Pavlova. Well, with David, it's very similar. Growing up as a schoolboy in the 1930s, he watched Ashton's choreography, uh, performed by the then Bick Wells Company, of course, now the Royal, uh, and Ron Bear. And similarly, he was injected with the poison. Uh, so after that, actually having this great love of, of dance, he served in the war. And instead of returning to Oxford after um, the war, uh, he decided he Although it was rather late in the day, he was going to train in dance. He took classes with uh, Ron Bear and with Audrey de Vos. And then he managed to uh, get a scholarship from Lincoln Kirstein to go to New York. Uh, and that really was the focus of his subsequent career. David's aim was to be a choreographer. Um, he did choreograph. He choreographed on stage and film. He performed, uh, he performed indeed so many roles. Um, he was also, I think, someone who was incredibly helpful to many British uh, artists who went to America in the, the 50s, 60s, uh, and thereafter. A great, great supporter and encourager of others. From my own perspective, it was the fact that David was such a, a wonderful company choreographer. In, when he got to America, he fell in love with Cunningham's choreography. Uh, so having these two great um, sort of choreographers whose work he severely um, admired and well documented. Uh, and so it's when I was sort of setting out as an archivist, I got to know David. Um, he certainly was a role model for me, an inspiration, and he became a friend. Um, and I'm very pleased I can say that. Also, in respect of um, Ashton, of course, he did perform. He performed as the narrator uh, in Wedding Bow. So in many senses, he was somebody who loved Ashton's works, shared Ashton's works with a wider public, uh, and did a great deal for dance. So just a, a remembrance, and today's session is dedicated to David. But on to Rossignol, which is my main focus. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, its place in Ashton's career. Rossignol, briefly, as created by Stravinsky and first performed by the Ballet Russe. And then Rossignol and its production, initially at the Metropolitan Opera House in New York, um, when it's designed by David Hockney and directed by John Dexter. So a British team, along with the choreographer uh, Frederick Ashton, being very responsible for that production. But first of all, it's worth just sort of bearing in mind, um, Ashton does not have an enormous uh, involvement uh, with opera productions. Uh, as a young dancer in 1928, he did perform on the Royal Opera House stage uh, as in the opera ballets uh, for the Royal Italian Opera, uh, choreography by 
someone probably most of you have never heard of, Ambrosini, who used to work at the Monet uh, in Brussels and then nip over uh, at the end of the Belgian season for the London season uh, and year after year choreograph the works, which mainly meant he hoped everybody or enough people remembered what they were doing last year uh, and could do more or less the same thing and he'd just push a few people around. Um, it certainly wasn't the same class as Ashton's choreography. So uh, certainly having had that experience. And then when he starts as a choreographer, um, amongst his early works, of course, The Fairy Queen, uh, first as divertissement, subsequently returning to Purcell's opera, working in Four Saints in uh, three acts, uh, again, a creation for America, like his Rossignol. Uh, and then post-war, the most important uh, involvements with opera being with Benjamin Britten uh, for Albert Herring, in 1947 and Death in Venice in 1973. So essentially, um, I think it gives a sort of a more greater importance to Rossignol uh, in uh, Ashton's output. He does, of course, work with uh, other uh, works that have vocal elements. So I don't want to sort of go into that side very much. I just want to remind you that there is that sort of context. And similarly, um, Frederick Ashton as a choreographer doesn't actually turn a great deal to the Orient for inspiration. Um, he doesn't go in for Oriental ballets in a big way. So again, this makes Rossignol something slightly different. Of course, there are works as Chinese dance. He choreographs the, the solo, the divertissement from Nutcracker. And of course, there is uh, Madame Cronson-Temme. But it's not really, he's not a choreography generally of chinoiserie is what I'm really getting to say there. Um, so, I think that um, one can look at uh, Rossignol and you'll be seeing some of the choreography today. You will recognise elements from um, Ashton's uh, work. Uh, I think you can obviously see in there the influence of Pavlova in the role of the Nightingale. Um, and very much, I think, this is, is uh, a work, as we will see, that depended very much on the two creators of the roles. So Anthony Dowell as the fisherman and Makarova as the Nightingale. I just want to briefly go back in time. Um, so this is an established opera, but not one that was very widely performed in terms of Rossignol. It was created, it was written by Stravinsky between 1909 and 1914. So that's really quite a wide time span. It's also a very significant time span if you think of Stravinsky. 1909 is pre-Firebird. 1914 is post Sacre du Printemps. A huge range of development for the composer came into this work. So the first act, which is the scene we'll be looking at today, um, does have sort of certain links musically to Firebird. Um, and then the whole work moves on. It's worth reminding you um, that the premiere was for uh, Diaghilev's Ballet Russe. And it always sounds strange when you're saying operas with ballet russe. Um, but 1914 season is actually an incredible season, I think, for um, Diaghilev's company. It tends to get a bit overlooked because it follows uh, 1913 and Sacre du Printemps. Also, of course, uh, Václav Nijinsky is no longer dancing with the company. But it is the season, really, where opera and ballet come together in a way that is quite extraordinary. It's the season of Coq d'Or, Prince Igor, and Rossignol, all of which combine the elements very, very strongly. The opera was actually intended for Moscow, for a private opera company in Moscow. That company collapsed, hence the premiere in Paris and London uh, in 1914 uh, by Diaghilev. Um, I would like to remind you very briefly, it's based on a Hans Christian Andersen story. Um, quite a simple uh, plot for the work in actual fact. Uh, act one is a night by the seashore, the edge of the forest, uh, and it's very much the sort of scene setting um, moment. The fisherman admires the voice of the nightingale, the song of the nightingale. He waits for it at night. It is only, it appears, the more common people who are really impressed by the nightingale because the nightingale is a rather unattractive little bird. Um, nothing showy about her um, and so uh, 
in that first scene, uh, the cook, or actually it was uh, uh, the young maid in the original story, um, takes some of the courtiers from the palace, the chamberlain, the bonds, and some of the courtiers to hear uh, the sound of the nightingale that they will then introduce to the emperor. In the um, opera, and indeed in the uh, play, they initially uh, mistake uh, sort of the sounds of the nightingale. They hear cows lowing and frogs croaking, and they don't know the difference, um, but they do when they hear the real nightingale. Act two um, is in the Porcelain Paris, uh, Palace. Um, when the nightingale is introduced, impresses the emperor. The emperor offers jewels in the way apparently emperors do. Not that I've ever met any of them. Um, uh, but the nightingale is, is much more impressed with the fact that the emperor has tears in his eyes and obviously really appreciates uh, the sounds that she is making. Um, however, she is ousted uh, when the, Chinese, the Japanese delegation bring a mechanical bird along, uh, which is all sort of very, very sort of showy. The third act, the mechanism has gone wrong. Um, it's in the bedchamber, the emperor is dying, uh, and the nightingale returns and has a battle with death. So her song triumphs over death, um, and then basically is back in, in favour. Um, so it's, it's a, a simple story, and in the opera, the fisherman actually is sort of the bookends to the whole thing. He's heard the song, he also makes the last comments. Um, he actually comments at the end of each act. So in a way, it's something like a narrator, possibly you could interpret it all as a fantasy in his mind. So, um, as I say, 1914, season uh, sponsored by Joseph Beecham. Uh, and because of that, when the company closed, Beecham hung on to all the sets and costumes. And when in 1919, he revived it for the only other times that this has been performed at the uh, Opera House, uh, he was using the same basic material, completely uncredited. Um, some of you may have remember that the Matisse uh, version is a later version, and that's where Stravinsky has actually taken the, um, the music from the opera and there are no vocalists attached. Um, so that is probably the better known staging. Now I want to jump forward to the production at the Metropolitan in New York, production by John Dexter. So we've got our first image up, good. So this was in the, the, um, the beginning of the 80s and it is really the second of two significant um, triple bills that were designed by David Hockney uh, for the Metropolitan. In the 1980-81 season, uh, and this did not involve Ashton, um, they put together a, a, a triple bill that they called Parade. So it was three works by French composers, Eric Satie, Francis Poulenc and Maurice Ravel, um, and John Dexter and um, Hockney uh, worked together uh, and it's aroused a great deal of interest. And it was decided to follow up this success with a program that they called as an umbrella Stravinsky. It was the centenary of, of, of Stravinsky. Uh, and so an excuse to put on three works. It was clearly a very long program uh, because it included the Rite of Spring, Oedipus and Rossignol. Uh, and Anthony was in both um, Oedipus and uh, Rossignol so as a narrator as well as a dancer. Um, then what happened was that in 1983, um, in London, at the beginning of the, the season, they took one work from each of those two metropolitan programmes and put them together. So London basically saw L'Enfant et Sortilage from the first programme and Rossignol from the second. Um, probably a much more digestible programme uh, for an audience. And I remember it was amazing. Uh, and a couple of years later, there was uh, the Hockney Paints the Stage exhibition in London. Some of you may have seen it. It was um, not so much showing you the actual material from the production as one of Hockney's recreations of the atmosphere of all his stage design. And if you want to sort of follow up this production, certainly from a visual pers perspective, I know there's quite a lot on, on the internet, uh, but this book uh, does actually include a sort of a picture story of the whole production. So. It's just a, a reminder for those who want more. 
Anyway, um, the production began with uh, John Dexter and, and David Hockney really sort of collaborating. Um, having said that, initially uh, there was an idea that Jocelyn Herbert uh, would be the designer on this occasion. Uh, and I think one can see that Jocelyn Herbert, who was fantastic uh, at doing masks, uh, would have been an appropriate person, but it would have looked very different from the very sort of uh, powerfully staged uh, Hockney staging. The initial idea was to focus on two elements, uh, and that was the circle, and that would relate to all the productions and masks. Uh, so it was a, a, an evening that involved those uh, sort of three things. It's also an evening that was based on ritual. So the primitivism of Sapri Prantam, uh, the artificial refinement of the Chinese court with Rossignol, and then, of course, the preordained fate of Sophocles, coming through in Oedipus, uh, obviously in the version by Jean Cocteau. Dexter and Hockney for Rossignol decided that they wanted to really evoke the idea of porcelain. They looked at uh, blue and white porcelain, both at Chatsworth and in the Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, and so the whole production is very, very blue. I think there you, can, you get the sense of the circle. Uh, and you get the sense of this blue and white uh, element that, that dominated. And so the only real other elements of colour that comes in are uh, with the mechanical nightingale. Uh, and that was gold and the Japanese court were in red and gold. So you had a sense of contrast coming there. In fact, I would say in many ways, the costumes for the nightingale and the fisherman were amongst the most sort of modest and muted of the, um, the whole thing. But I think it's quite interesting that from very early on, they knew they wanted Frederick Ashton to choreograph the work. Um, and John Dexter had clear ideas. He wanted to follow the original idea of having the singers of those two roles off stage or in the pit. Um, and uh, the focus would be on the danced elements uh, of the performance uh, of the two leading role. Um, as he said, he would, uh, from the very beginning, he had told Ashton uh, that the fisherman would be partner of the nightingale. In fact, one of the earliest notes, and this is John Dexter speaking, one of the earliest notes I sent our choreographer, Frederick Ashton, was that the fisherman was available for partnering, mainly because I know Sir Fred's delight in complicated Nothing lifts. <laughs> also, if you want to give the impression of a bird moving through the air, you lift. So um, I think that was sort of quite clear, because although the fisherman is not an active participant uh, at the court, it meant that he could be treated almost in a way uh, as in Oriental theatre, as somebody who moves around. Um, that's, that's not to denigrate your role at all. Um, <laughs> no, we're used to it. <laughs> just there for the lift. Um, but it, is, it just shows it's, it's a clear I idea. Um, and indeed, the, in the original cast, um, one of the dancers is referred to uh, as the partner of the, the, the Nightingale. So um, it was in, in 1914. Um, so, so basically, it was a case of the collaboration uh, between um, the elements coming together. Uh, David Hockney, having got the ideas, went away and created the costumes. Uh, and he said that for the, um, the nightingale, uh, I painted a few marks on it, the leotard, to suggest bird feathers. But she didn't need much because she was so convincing on stage. Earlier, I had started sketches for costumes for the nightingale that included wings. But the choreographer told me, no, the suggestion will be made through the dancer's movements. And it was. Uh, Makarova was unbelievably beautiful, and when she was lifted out of the tree, her arms flittered like wings. So obviously, success was uh, uh, the, the choreographer Ashton knew exactly what he wanted um, in that sort of sense, and working with uh, David Hockney on this work was able to guide him so that the costumes would be made so that they were particularly effective. Now, I just would like to read um, uh, a couple of uh, comments. Firstly, I was just going to read uh, one of the reviews uh, uh, of the production in New York. Uh, and this is Patricia Barnes actually writing uh, for Dance and Dancers. And, he's, and she says, Ashton's choreography fits perfectly into Dexter's staging concept. 
It must be said, uh, David Vaughan wished that um, Ashton had been on hand uh, when the elements of the pas de deux that was created in London was incorporated into the opera as it was staged in New York because he could have improved uh, the sort of processions uh, coming through. To go on. It is as tender and shaded with humanity as in the Hans Christian Andersen tale from which the libretto de derives and makes glorious use of the, pro the proportion and grace of his two dancers. Ashton displays them individually with great sensitivity, revealing Makarova's lovely line and Dowell's flawless control. Many of the soaring lifts show off Makarova with simple yet telling eloquence. Her expressive and supple body her tremulous flutterings have all the appropriate delicacy and vulnerability. Dowell is riveting in Ashton's solos, unerringly placed in classical elegance, his multiple pirouettes given, and giving the chinoiserie accents of the choreography with flex feet and unusual angle pose, the harmony of the outline, the chiseled beauty of living sculpture. From our first view, the fisherman dreaming of the nightingale on the shore, to our initial view of the lovely creature herself, partly hidden by the foliage of the tree, her arms reaching forward as if longing to take flight. Ashton's use of Makarova and Dal never ceases to enthrall, and how they respond. And so it goes on. Um, so essentially, um, and I think most of the critics were very happy with, with what um, Ashton uh, uh, achieved in this. Now, unfortunately, it's a work that hasn't been seen very often, um, which, of course, is then going to present challenges uh, with the revival. Uh, so it was performed in New York, um, and it was actually revived in New York with Damien Boetzel uh, and Julie Kent, and it remains a bit of a mystery quite how that production revival came into to, um, staging. Um, uh, and, of course, uh, Roehampton, uh, have in their Ashton programme, did some research into this work, uh, which, of course, is a, a great asset. Um, but it is a work that is somewhat lost. It's not something that we've had the chance to see uh, very much of. Uh, and so I think we will move on to the masterclass. But before we just get there, um, we had a wonderful message from Makarova, um, who wanted to share with you, um, or wanted me to pass on, uh, one of her recollections. I still remember a very funny moment in one of our performances of Rossignol at the Met. For my first appearance, I had to climb onto a branch of the tree, which was then wheeled on, out onto the stage. Somehow, in one performance, the tree was left, the tree left without me, and I was in the wings trying to figure out a tricky way of unnoticeably getting onto the stage to be able to appear in the tree. I can give a demonstration of that. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony was on stage awaiting my arrival. When he saw the empty tree, <laughs> I still laugh. Um, when envisaging how Anthony looked over to sorry, the wings, to me in the wings, uh, and extended his index finger as if to say, jump out and perch here. <laughs> I did, in fact, find a way to make my magical appearance. So now we will have Dell's magical appearance, and we'll just say a few well, words. The the magical period <laughs> when we created this of course we didn't know what the set would be but um, there was a moment once the fisherman had done his solo where these they were two trees on trucks rather similar to palm trees and there was a ledge in which she would be behind the tree and then she came out and I lifted her out but the set was this big circular stage and there weren't wings it was just black a huge metropolitan operas and halfway towards the end of the solo I saw this image going I am a bird but if you see me I am a bird but I'm not meant to be seen <laughs> that that was it and I think she's I mean I'm sure those stagehands were cued I think she was late but don't tell her I said that <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, we've just got a, a few more images, so we just sort of go through them. So the sense of the masks for the uh, procession, again with the uh, circular the stage. Uh, then we have 
one of the costumes, so this is obviously one of the singer's costumes, you can see it on display at the moment uh, in the Theatre and Performance Gallery at the v &A. You have to look very carefully because it's tucked at the back, but it is there. So there's the, gives you a sense of the colours um, actually as they were realised. Uh, and then we have, uh, there we have oh, our stars, Dal and Makarova. Um, in the, the performance, oh, mm. and then just a couple of rehearsal photographs. <laughs> with, with Sir Fred. So, this is the, the London um, aspect uh, yeah. of the uh, rehearsal process. So, yes, do, you, do you want to just to say yes. a little bit more about, about um, how it was um, made and then we'll go into the, the Masterclass? Um, well, probably. we knew that Sir Fred, although he was adulated in New York and loved New York, for some reason he wasn't going to come. I think Jane said he was involved with Illuminations here. That's right. They premiered so on the, uh, the uh, revival of Illumination for, for the Royal Ballet, premiered on the same day as uh, Rossignol in New York and Sir Fred could not be in two places at once. Yeah, so I, I think Fred from John Dexter, the director, had certain um, notes about it, but we created it in a studio, in the old studios in Barons Court, and on the last rehearsal, Dina Makarova, um, Natasha's great friend and personal assistant, filmed it in the studio. Um, and then we went to New York and then we were confronted with the set and the tree, trees and all that. Um, out of all the ballets I've danced, some are very indelibly etched in your brain and, and muscle memory and some aren't. And Rossignol is one of those that isn't etched <laughs> in my brain. I was asked to revive a solo for um, Stephanie Jordan at the Roehampton Institute and there were some very poor quality films. In those days, a camera would be in the grand tier, say at the Opera House or at the Metropolitan Opera House, and by the time you saw the film, we were about that size, and they were very poor quality. But I somehow managed to get the solo. But the pas de deux was very hard, and I thought that had gone and lost beneath the waves. I remembered this film, and we went on a great, once I knew this masterclass was happened and we only had the solo, I thought, well, probably we, we'd lovely if we could get the Pau de Deux together. And we went on this search, phoning Dina Makarova, where was this film? I remember taking this cassette to New York, giving it to the opera ballet master. I phoned him in New York, he said he gave it back to me, we couldn't find it. And at the back of a cupboard, I had a series of <laughs> tapes that I gave to Bennett, who has made this film possible, and blow me down, it came to light, this film. It was rather like the Holy Grail, and it's a film of our last rehearsal. Not great quality, but you can see the part of Deux, and with the great help of Gary Avis, who's a ballet master and, was a, and is a character principal of the Royal Ballet, and Lorraine, the most wonderful choreologist. They have been my helpers. I couldn't have done it without them, because now with modern technology, Everything is put onto tablets, and there they are taking it off. I'm a dinosaur technologically, so I couldn't, I really couldn't have done without them. So I do what I can, and I chip in when I can with memories, and sometimes I'll remember something. What happens over the years is that this film was taken when it was first created. When you get to performing it, things change, you develop things. So um, I might remember something that actually isn't clear on the film itself. So it's a sort of collaboration of my memory and then, and Lorraine has been brilliant in doing the score with Michael, our pianist, and actually nailing it on, on the music because it's quite a tricky score. Most of it's done to, well, I dance to the voice of the fisherman and the nightingale is to a soprano. So it's quite hard to nail it on. But we put together my first solo when the fisherman uh, when dawn happens, and there's a lot of gestures, a lot of um, gauzes and silk gauzes were going on, and the trees, of course, coming on. And then when we do the pas de deux on the film, because Ash didn't know that the trees were coming on, we but do the lift. originally, I lifted her actually out of this tree. So we'll get to a bit of the pas de deux afterwards.